Adedine. My name is Dwayne Cave, and I'm the External Relations Manager for San Diego Gas and Electric, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We want to thank Orange County Supervisor Lisa Bartlett for hosting this webinar in cooperation with each of the local chambers of commerce within her district. Election integrity is both a national and a state issue. As many of you are aware, national elections are actually conducted state by state. In a state like California, elections are locally conducted in each of the 58 counties under the guidance of the Secretary of State for the state of California. And now who best to tell you how elections work in Orange County than our very own Registrar of Voters, Neil Kelly. But first, I'd like to introduce the host for today's program, Orange County's 5th District Supervisor, Lisa Bartlett. Lisa began her career in public service when she was first elected to the Dana Point City Council in 2006. During her first term on the City Council, she served as mayor and mayor pro tem for the city. Supervisor Bartlett was elected to the Orange County Board of Supervisors in 2014 and was re-elected in 2018 to represent the fabulous 5th District. She serves as chairwoman of the Board of Supervisors in 2016 and 2019. In addition to her role on the Orange County Board of Supervisors, Lisa represents her constituents on several regional and state boards and commissions. She is the immediate past president of the California State Association of Counties and was recently appointed as at-large member to the National Association of Counties. She also serves on the board of directors for the Orange County Transportation Authority, Orange County Fire Authority, the Transportation Corridor Agencies, South Coast Air Quality Management District, just to name a few. Please join me welcoming Supervisor Lisa Bartlett, who will make some opening remarks and introduce our keynote speaker, Orange County Registrar of Voters, Neil Kelly. Lisa. Thank you so much for the introduction, Dwayne, and, and welcome everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. You know, election integrity is a really important topic, and it's really top of mind right now with the past elections and also with future elections as well. But before we get to the election and get to um, Neil Kelly, I just want to go over a couple things related to the oil spill. Because um, in Dana Point, our beaches and our harbor are the last remaining areas that are really closed right now, 100% along the Orange County coastline. So in going back to the oil spill that occurred last um, Saturday um, to present, you know, once it was determined that there was a leak, um, authorities went into high gear, booms were um, put out into the ocean, and the beaches and harbors along our Orange County coastline of 42 miles, they were closed along the way. So at this point, Dana Point has the only remaining beaches and harbor that's still closed. Um, what we know at this point was that the pipeline in the ocean, for whatever reason, was moved 105 feet from its original location, which caused a 13 inch crack in the pipe. Um, it, I believe it was determined Saturday early morning that there, um, there was a leak. Um, the state was notified and dispatched right away. The pipeline was then closed, I think about nine o'clock in the morning and um, maybe it was six o'clock in the morning and the state was notified at nine o'clock. Um, but authorities went into and the agencies went into effect right away. We have a unified command unit that is in place right now. And all of the reporting agencies, the state, Fish and Wildlife, the counties, the cities are all engaged along with the Coast Guard relative to the cleanup efforts. We've been very fortunate that there has not been a lot of loss of sea life and um, waterfowl, um, but we've got the organizations um, that are taking care of anything that comes into the hotline. So if there's any waterfowl or sea life that are injured or have oil on them, um, there's a hotline number to call and the organizations are right on top of it. The booms are soaking up the oil. And at this point, um, we're hoping to get everything uh, reopened along our, our coastline in Orange County as quickly as possible. This afternoon, I'll be going up in a plane with fish and wildlife along the coastline in Orange County. And hopefully we'll get the all clear sign that everything is fine in the Dana Point area and that our last remaining um, harbor and beaches can get reopened. So fingers crossed. And I just wanted to give everyone that uh, little glimmer of hope for, uh, for today, and hopefully we'll be able to reopen shortly. 
So now getting on to um, Neil Kelly, I want to um, welcome everyone. And um, before we get started, I just wanted to share with you the purpose of Neil's presentation this morning. Recently, it was brought to my office's attention that some members of the community are concerned about the integrity of the election process right here in Orange County. And when it comes to our elections, it is critical that the public know that without a shadow of a doubt, that when they cast their ballot here in Orange County, be it by mail, voter drop box, or in person, that their ballot is secure and that it's counted. When rumors and innuendo and misinformation begin to erode the public's confidence in the process, it's really important that we set the record straight to ensure that the public's continued faith and trust is right there in our system here in the county. Um, Neil Kelly, the county's registrar of voters, is inarguably the most respected registrar in the state of California and very well respected by his peers across the United States. So we have a real superstar on our county team here. Um, the measures that he and his staff have implemented to protect the integrity of the election process are second to none and serve as a model for the rest of the nation. As we enter the next election cycle, it's really important to know fact from fiction. And that's why Neil Kelly is here with us today. Neil is the registrar of voters for the fifth largest voting jurisdiction in the United States serving more than 1.8 million registered voters. So in our county, we have 3.2 million people, 1.8 million registered voters. He has served in this position since 2005 and leads an organization. Um, basically, he's led his office through the largest cycle of elections since Orange County was founded in 1889. So his role as the county's chief election official, um, in that role, he leads an organization responsible for conducting elections, verifying petitions, and maintaining voter records. He's been the recipient of numerous state and national awards for election administration, and is a past president of the Public Official of the Year Award by the National Association of County Recorders, Election Officials, and Clerks. Neil was named as one of Orange County's most 100 influential individuals by the Orange County Register in 2016, 2019, and 2020. He is a former appointee and founding member of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security Election Security Task Force, known as the Government Coordinating Council, where he helped to oversee the protection of the nation's election infrastructure. He also serves as a member and past chair of the U.S. Election Assistance Commission, the EAC um, Board of Advisors, and is a member of the EAC Voting System Standards Board and a former member of the EAC Technical Guidelines Development Committee. In addition, Neil served as a member of the 2018 National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicines Committee on, future, on the Future of Voting. He's been invited to testify before committees of the U.S. House, the U.S. Civil Rights Commission, the Presidential Commission on Election Administration, several state elective bodies, and both federal and state courts. Neil is the past president of the California Association of Clerks and Election Officials and the National Association of County Recorders, Election Officials, and Clerks. Neil earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Business and Management from the University of Redlands and an MBA from the University of Southern California. In addition to our Registrar of Voters, Neil Kelly, I also want to thank the Dana Point Chamber of Commerce and their Executive Director, Vicki Mc McMurtry, um, for hosting today's Zoom webinar. And thank you to Dwayne Cave, who is First Vice President of the Moulton Nagel Water District and will serve as the moderator and Q&A portion for today's presentation. As always, my office has an open door policy and I welcome your comments and questions. Feel free to contact me at my office at 714-834-3550 if I can ever be of assistance or visit my website at soupbartlett.com. That's S-U-P-B-A-R-T-L-E-T-T.com for more information. So thank you again for participating in today's town hall webinar with our esteemed Registrar of Voters, Mr. Neil Kelly. And Neil, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Supervisor, and uh, for the kind introduction and for your leadership on this issue. I really appreciate uh, the invitation today. 
And also a big thank you to Vicki and Duane uh, for your work on, on this webinar. I have spoken and had the pleasure to speak to many of the chambers in South County in person over the years. And I always like to say that um, my heart's with chambers because I was the president of a local chamber many years ago uh, when I was in the private sector. And so I uh, really enjoyed my time uh, in our chambers. Uh, so a number of things I wanna to cover today with you and I'm looking forward to some dialogue and, and questions uh, towards the end. And let me just share my screen really quickly here. Thanks for your patience. And that should be up and you should see that. Uh, so a, a couple of things I wanna uh, focus on first. One is talk a little bit about the recall election and give you some background on that and uh, where we ended up with the recall. And then talk uh, briefly about redistricting. Uh, what are some of the challenges with redistricting for this cycle? And what our plans are here at the Registrar of Voters? And then talk about um, really the, the topic of the day and that is election security and auditing and what we do differently here in Orange County than all other counties in California and many other counties in the United States. And I hope that you're going to see that as this uh, discussion evolves over the morning here. Uh, as Supervisor Bartlett said, we are the fifth largest jurisdiction in the United States. I think one of the things that is important to point out is that we have more registered voters right here in Orange County than 23 other states, the entire states in the United States. And so that really lets you know that we're not only on a national platform here, but um, there's certainly a lot of scrutiny of our elections here in the county. And so just... Um, Briefly, my role as the Registrar of Voters uh, is to oversee all elections here in Orange County and to differentiate us a little bit from, let's say, Los Angeles County, where many cities run their own elections in Los Angeles County. Here in Orange County, we run all 34 cities' elections, all special districts, all school districts, and obviously state and federal. Um, so Orange County is a little bit unique in that regard because many other counties in the state will run uh, a portion of the elections. So here's some background on the recall that we just uh, concluded. And fun fact Thursday for you, uh, we were the first county in California to certify the recall election. Now, why is that important? It's not a race, uh, but we have worked over the years to improve efficiencies so that we can certify and get the results out much quicker uh, than in years past. And why is that important? Certainly on smaller elections or even let's say a, pr a presidential where you might have city councils included, on that you wanna be able to get the election done quickly so that you can seat those members uh, that, are, that are newly elected. I was a little surprised that we were the first county in California to certify out of all 58, because the smaller counties with just a few thousand voters um, surprised me a bit, but uh, counties do have until October the 14th to complete their certification. We had a nearly 63% turnout, which was very strong for Orange County. I was expecting we would be probably in the mid 50s based on all the data I was looking at leading into election day, but Orange County voters got out and voted. You might think, well, 63% uh, doesn't seem that high, but for a special election, that's very high. Consider back in 2003, the recall election with uh, uh, Governor Schwarzenegger and Gray Davis, um, that turnout here in Orange County was 61%. So we beat the 2003 recall. The other thing I think that's important to point out here, here is that we were the highest turnout in Southern California. Uh, so a lot of energy here in the county. When you compare it to the presidential election in 2020, which was almost 90%, uh, you can see a little bit lower than that, that turnout. But the presidential election, I was very proud of that because 90% uh, turnout was the highest in Orange County's history, except for 1960, uh, which was just slightly higher by a few percentage points. But what's unique about that is that in 1960, we only had 400,000 registered voters. And now with 1.8 million, you know, we had uh, nearly a 90% turnout, which was terrific. You might be interested in the demographics of who turned out for this election here in Orange County. And uh, by and large, um, we saw a higher turnout or, or activity among millennials than we have seen in past special elections. Uh, Generation X and baby boomers made up uh, the bulk of the turnout. Uh, but what, what was also interesting was that we had a lot of first time voters uh, for the recall election. So those that were in the millennial category and even Gen Z uh, were first time voters. This was their very first election uh, out of the gate. So this is interesting. I think we're gonna see continued 
involvement in energy for millennials as we head into 22 and 24. I don't, I don't see that slowing down. Party turnout, Republicans turn out at slightly a higher rate than Democrats for the recall election. But keep your eye on that orange bar right there. Should be purple because that's our purple voters here in Orange County. Those are voters that are unaffiliated with a party. And I believe if you look at the data and you see how this panned out, that those voters had certainly an influence on the outcome of this election uh, here in Orange County. And you, you can't ignore those voters because they're the fastest growing block of voters here in the county. When you compare turnout uh, from a party perspective to the 2020 presidential election, it was flipped just a little bit. Democrats turned out at a higher rate in the presidential election than Republicans, almost evenly split though. Um, but again, that, that purple voting block uh, has, is very energized and it's gonna see, a lot, I think we're gonna see a lot of activity as we move into the 22 and 24 cycle. In-person turnout was, uh, uh, not too surprising. Um, we did see heavier turnout in person of Republicans over Democrats. But if you think about 10, 12, 15 years ago, Democrats were turning out at a much higher rate in person than Republicans. And so we have seen a little bit of adjustment in that data. Um, but the other thing I think that's important to note here is that uh, Democrats turned out at a higher rate early on. Republicans turned out at a much higher rate much later in the cycle. Uh, and we had 11 days worth of voting. So there's a lot of opportunities for in-person ballots to be cast. And then of course, 30 days for, for mail ballots. Return methods completely flipped from the 2020 election. Uh, in the 2020 November election, um, you can see here that the majority of our uh, returns, people that use their mail ballot uh, were placed into drop boxes. And Dropbox usage was very strong in the 2020 presidential election, bipartisan. Uh, we saw almost an even split between Dems and Republicans on the use of Dropboxes. But when you go back to 2020 and you think about the comments that President Trump was making at the time about mail balloting, et cetera, we did see a reduction. And I think that could certainly, there's a correlation there in that data to, to his comments. Now, fast forward to the recall election and it's completely flipped. We had a lot heavier usage of mail ballots through the mail versus Dropboxes, although Dropboxes was still very heavy volume. Uh, and I'll talk about Dropboxes in just a second and, and the, the security on that. Okay, just a, a few comments about redistricting because I, certainly that should be top of mind that right now is uh, something that we have been planning for for well over a year. Um, you, you probably know that the, the data is late because of the census data being late due to COVID-19. And so there's a lot of work that's being done to play catch up uh, with respect to that. There's been many bills that have been passed by the legislature. There have been several court cases that have kind of teed everything up for as we head into this fall season uh, and, and the redistricting process. And I'll walk you through just briefly uh, what that is. Redistricting in general, uh, process of adjusting lines and voting districts based on every 10 years of census data. And those boundary lines are redrawn uh, throughout the community based on that data that comes down from the census. Uh, just so you're aware, state's responsible for drawing congressional and state legislative districts. That's through the redistricting commission. The redistricting commission just recently got the data from the secretary of state so they can begin that process on the congressional and state lines. And then the county is responsible for drawing the supervisorial districts. Cities and school districts are responsible for their own districts as well. What's coming up for the primary season is the new boundary lines for legislative, uh, congressional, and state, as well as our, our county supervisorial districts. Later in the year, for the November election, we'll see redrawn boundaries for uh, our cities and our school districts and special districts. So just to give you an idea of those dates uh, that are coming up, the redistricting deadline for the state has been shifted. It's been shifted a couple of times, actually. The Supreme Court just ruled uh, on a case uh, just a couple of weeks ago uh, that the redistricting commission put forward and the redistricting commission was asking for a delay in the redrawing of the boundary lines for congressional and state district uh, to mid-January. Now that really would cause a lot of problems downstream for many counties that are redrawing. I, we've done a lot of work here in Orange County and we knew that we could be prepared to handle this if it came in by about January 15th. That's not ideal and the Supreme Court kind of split the baby on this one and decided that the deadline would be December 27th. 
The deadline for the county redistricting boundary lines is December 15th. And then fast forwarding to next year for cities is April 17th and for school districts and special districts, it's February 28th. Uh, but that's not the deadline for my office. For my office to get the boundaries, the data from these organizations, that's a different set of dates. And um, for the county and for the state legislative lines, et cetera, that's gonna be early February. And then for the cities and special districts and school districts, that's going to be July. So that's the deadline to get it to my office to be able for us to be, prepare the data and get it into ballot types, et cetera. Because of the changes in these dates, the signature and loop period has shifted. So it will not open in December. It's going to open uh, in January, January 3rd for the state legislative boundary lines. I'm still getting some legal opinions on exactly when it will open for other offices, uh, but it probably will be close to that same time period in early January. Nomination period uh, for offices will open on February 14th. That's unchanged from this redistricting process, and it will close on March the 11th. So keep that March 11th date in the back of your mind, because that's the time period that you'll know when uh, who is going to qualify for the ballot and who will be on the ballot. The biggest challenge for us in this short condensed time frame is getting the data and inputting the data into our election management systems, redrawing the precinct boundary lines based on the data from the redrawn boundary lines from the jurisdictions, and then proofing that data. And here's the challenge. If you have a house that's outside of a district line and wasn't proofed correctly, that household is going to be getting the wrong ballot. Uh, because your neighbor may have a completely different ballot type than you do. So it's absolutely vital that my office does military precision work on that redistricting process. Uh, it only comes around every 10 years, so we do a lot of planning for this, but we're prepared for this, we're prepared for the delay, and we'll have those boundary lines done in time for candidate filing to open. All right, so that gives you a background on the recall election itself. And redistricting, and I want to jump into, you know, kind of the title of the topic here, and that is election security auditing, et cetera. And I want to start off by talking about misinformation and disinformation. And Supervisor Bartlett touched on this a little bit in her opening remarks. This has been a challenge for election officials across the country. Uh, we have seen a definite rise in misinformation, and I would just urge everyone here, um, and, and, and I think this is the case, but for people to not to get their news 100% from social media, because there's a lot of information that can be gathered on, let's say, election information, election security, et cetera, from other sources other than just social media. Um, there's been a tremendous amount of research that's out there, both at the federal and state level, as well as our local level here in Orange County, uh, about uh, fighting misinformation. And a quick note on that, we received uh, just over 25,000 phone calls from the time we mailed ballots for the recall election until election day. And less than 1% of those phone calls that came in to us were questions from people about conspiracy theories or misinformation. And it was really good for my, my telephone operators to spend time with them, to be able to walk them through issues. And a lot of them were looking for balanced facts. And, and I think that was really helpful. And we've created web pages that we call our trusted election official pages that I'll talk about in a second. Uh, but it provides uh, balanced information on rumors that might be circulating out there or things that you might have read on the internet. And I think that's really helpful. Um, the one thing that I think is, is really important to note is that we don't, we shouldn't conflate disagreements with election law, regulations, et cetera, with election fraud. They're two distinctly separate things. And a lot of the questions and the things that we hear through, through phone calls and through contacts with my office are commingling those things. Uh, and that, that's a problem. And we, and we work very hard to, to work through those issues with voters and, and to sort that out. So the drop boxes on the left versus the blue box on the right. A couple of notes on those drop boxes. We have 120 throughout Orange County. As I mentioned earlier, very high usage for return ballots um, and bipartisan. You know, we have individuals across the spectrum that are using these ballot drop boxes and find them to be very convenient and a way to deliver their ballot directly to the custody of the election official. And we service those boxes daily. But a note on the boxes themselves, quarter inch steel, 
uh, one of the sturdiest boxes that's manufactured out there. It has a fire suppression system in it. We're the only county that has one. We have a water protection system inside of that. We have seals and chains of custody that lock those boxes on a daily basis and photographs of everything that's taken in and put in or taken out and put back in uh, in an empty box. And that's all collected into a database with a very strict audit log. I have teams of two that go out daily. The regulations in California, believe it or not, do not require daily pickup. I think that's inappropriate. Uh, the optics of that are not good and the security of that is not good. And so we collect daily. They're radio dispatch. Um, we're on the sheriff's network and, and we're able to uh, track our teams using satellite transmission uh, on, on a daily basis. The routes are, are always changing. Uh, we work with Homeland Security on developing those routes and uh, they're never the same each day. They don't know what the route is going to be until they're in the car and leaving. Uh, the box on the right, you know, I, I want to say this about the post office. They're a very good partner with us. Um, the Orange County Post Office uh, and the postmaster here in Orange County has done a tremendous, a lot, a lot of work with our office to improve the mail delivery process and the tracking, et cetera, of our ballots. And uh, I will say at the national level as well, the post office has put a lot of attention on uh, uh, election mail. You may have read just recently in the last couple of days that the post office plans to slow down delivery of mail. That, and I've been reassured by the Board of Governors for the post office, as well as our local authorities, that uh, that will not affect election mail. That will continue to be a priority across the United States. Now, the, the thing about the box on the right is we have, as you saw in the recall election, more people were using that than our drop boxes. Um, and the security of mailboxes, you know, is, is a concern of mine. We get calls frequently from postal investigators where they have found ballots because people are stealing mail. They're not stealing ballots. They discard the ballots uh, and they are looking for checks and credit cards, et cetera. And we do have a good relationship with those postal investigators to address those things immediately, as well as our district attorney. Our voting system uh, recently changed. Uh, we were using our old legacy system for from 2003 up through 2020. And we recently adopted a new voting system here in Orange County. One of the things that I advocated for and was uh, very focused on throughout this process was making sure that we had a paper-based system. Paper-based systems uh, have been proven to be much more secure and reliable than electronic systems. And you have a paper backup you have a hand-marked paper ballot for every single vote that's cast. Your mail ballot that you might use through the mail is the exact same type of ballot that you would see in person. In fact, it's the same look uh, of a ballot, and that's not the case of other voting systems throughout the country. This system goes through a, a tremendous amount of certification and testing before the green light is ever given for a single ballot to be cast on. In fact, the system we're using here in Orange County went through a three-year process for federal certification alone, uh, including testing at labs across the country. And forgive this analogy, but I have to say this, that voting systems, I think uh, people don't understand what really goes behind the certification of a system. And there's more certification of a voting uh, system than slot machines, than ATM machines. And you think about things that we use in financial transactions on a daily basis. Um, that, that these voting systems are hardened and there's much more security behind this than, than any other uh, system you might be using on a daily basis for financial purposes. This trusted election official page, I just want to put up the URL there for you at ocvote.com, or now we're switching over to .gov uh, forward slash FAQ. We've listed the top 10 rumors that we hear through phone calls that come into our office or through social media. And then we provide factual information based on what we're hearing from our voters. And that helps to, as I mentioned earlier, provide this sort of balanced approach to what people might be hearing from their friends and family or reading on the internet. Uh, and, and this has, I think, been very useful. It's one of the most visited web pages other than our results page uh, that we've, we've seen over the last year here in the county. A couple of words about our election security partners. We don't do this in a vacuum, folks. And, and I think that's one of the things that's really important to, to point out here. We have built partnerships over the last four years with these agencies that you see here on screen. And I wanna talk about a few of them individually. 
Homeland Security and the FBI, we work with on a daily basis uh, leading up to any major election. We meet with agents from those organizations. And in fact, I partnered with uh, both Homeland and the FBI on changing our physical and cyber security platform. And that work has been done over the last couple of years. Um, and we're one of the few counties in California that has engaged those agencies on a regular basis and work with them very closely. Our district attorney here uh, in the county has been a tremendous partner with us. Uh, we refer cases to Mr. Spitzer's office uh, when, when items come up that require further investigation. The Secretary of State has a criminal investigation unit as well. And sometimes it just depends on what the issue was as to which agency is gonna take the lead on the criminal investigation. Uh, the Election Assistance Commission and NIST are both very involved on the voting system certification side. And we work closely with them on federal audits and, uh, and maintaining the security of our, our voting system itself. And then the Orange County uh, Assessment Center, which is OCAYAC, is a intelligence center here in Orange County made up of local law enforcement centers throughout the county. And uh, I'm in communication with them all the time related to election security issues. We're one of the few counties in California that has a 24-hour monitoring system uh, with DHS in Albany, New York. Our voter registration system and the data that comes into that is monitored, as I mentioned, 24 hours a day. If we have a vulnerability that's identified or we have what's identified as a potential uh, attempted breach, we're notified and that could be at three in the morning. And uh, DHS is working with us directly on patching those systems and working on additional security. They alert us on any suspicious activity. And I will tell you that, um, and this might not be a surprise to some of you in the IT field, but you know, our systems, as, as I'm sitting here talking to you, are being scanned by bots on a regular basis. Uh, every second, our system is being hit. And that's no different than a retail system or a banking system. And that's why it's so important to have a very strong ring of security uh, on your cyber platform to make sure that your, your vulnerabilities are, are not an issue, uh, that there, there are no vulnerabilities. And that's very important. And again, we work with Homeland uh, throughout the year, even if it's not during an election cycle. So I want to talk about audits and system tests, uh, and I want to break them into two categories. The first is those tests that are required by law versus those that are not required by California federal law. Required by law here in the state, um, the first step is what we do called a pre-election system test or a logic and accuracy test. And we do that on every single piece of the voting system. Any piece that actually captures a vote or tallies a vote goes through this pre-election system test. And what we're doing is we're running test ballots through every device, we're matching the tally and expect, and then doing a hand count on those ballots to make sure that all of that matches up before they're ever sealed and before the locks are placed on those voting systems. The second here is I think a little bit archaic, but it's an important piece, and I'll tell you why I think it's archaic in a second, is the 1% manual hand tally. And at random, 1% of the precincts are selected throughout the county. And then we do a physical hand count open to the public where we are counting by hand the votes that were cast and then comparing that to the tally. And obviously you don't want any discrepancies between your hand count and your, your tally that you've released. And then the third that's required under federal and state law, it's a very strict uh, chain of custody process and seals on every piece of equipment and every port uh, on every piece of equipment. And those chain of custodies and the serial numbers on those are checked on a daily basis. In fact, in some cases, hourly. Uh, and uh, that, that's a very important piece of the, of the pie here to make sure that those voting system components are not tampered with out in the field. Now, here's where I think it's a, Orange County's set apart from other counties, because we're the only county in the state of California. And, and what I'm gonna talk to you about now moving forward, the only county that are doing these items. The first up is a post-election system logic and accuracy test. We do the same thing that we did on the pre-LNA, but we do it post-election on every device that's coming back and every piece of tally equipment here in the office and do the exact same thing to make sure that there's no difference between the first test and the last test. Believe it or not, not required under state or federal law. The second thing that we've been doing since 2011 here in the county, and in fact, uh, was, was a champion of this uh, throughout the state, is what's called a risk limiting audit. Uh, you see a lot of RLAs in the financial sector, uh, but they are becoming very popular as well in the election uh, side. Not as popular as I'd like them to be, uh, but they are growing. 
An RLA essentially does this. It identifies areas within the election contest where if there were an issue, you would have a higher risk of a problem. So for instance, the algorithm may pick up a precinct that has the contest much closer together than a neighboring precinct, for instance. So those are where the targets are for going and finding those ballots, hand counting them, comparing them to the tally in that RLA process. All of it open to the public, all the software is open source and online. The ballot manifest, the, the, the manifest that we create to identify every single ballot that's been cast is put online. Uh, it's a very transparent process. And in fact, it's torn apart after every election by computer scientists around the country uh, that, that do this on a regular basis. And the third here, the third thing that we're doing is what's called a software hash test. The software that we use to tally the votes and that's on the voting system itself is strictly controlled by the Secretary of State and the federal government. You cannot have software residing on those systems that is not from the trusted build. The original source code that is kept in escrow by the Secretary of State has to match what you have on your har hardware systems. And we have to reinstall that before every election. That's not something that just sits and resides on that like your desktop computer. We take it off and we put it back on. And the hash test verifies that that is the trusted build in each of those components. The next thing I did uh, a couple of years ago was create a partnership with Caltech where I opened our office here to uh, the scientists from Caltech to do a full and complete scrub on our operation. And that includes the voter registration data. You know, a lot of the things that we saw out of Georgia, uh, Pennsylvania, et cetera, were concerns about the voter registration data just as much as they had concerns about the voting system data. And so one of the things I wanted to do was to have an audit on that voter registration system. And these scientists are scrubbing that data on a daily basis and they have published reports you can find them on Caltech's website or on our website as well, that goes through all of that, that data and the backup and the results of their analysis. And the results of their analysis have found uh, that there are no anomalies detected in our voter registration data based on the current framework of federal and state laws. And I think that's an important piece to point out here because I think them, some of the questions you might have is, well, how do we know that somebody that registers to vote is legally allowed to vote? And that's a whole nother discussion versus is the data safe? Is it maintained correctly? Um, and is there no penetration to that system? Because that's very important to, to determine. This is something that I'm, I'm proud of and I'm hoping that we're gonna be able to reach an agreement with Microsoft on this. And that is to enter into a partnership in 2022 for a pilot end-to-end -end verification system. And an E2E system uh, in voting is very new. Uh, we would be the first to pilot this in the state of California and actually uh, probably around the country. And what this does is it allows you as a voter to receive an encrypted code after you've cast your ballot that you can then go online and verify was your ballot tallied the way that you cast your vote? Not just did my office receive the ballot, but did the tally system Mark, pick up your, your vote just as you intended it and, and as it was marked. And this is end-to-end uh, -end solutions have been uh, developed for many years now. And uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to get through this certification process and enter into this pilot agreement. Because I think I heard from many voters that they wanna know, well, how do I know my vote was, was counted the way that I ta uh, marked it? And this would be a way that you could do that. So I'm looking forward to that, that continued discussion. A couple of notes on voter registration list maintenance. Um, and I say the good, the bad, and the ugly because I, I think that's the best <laughs> title for this piece of the discussion. And that is voter registration databases are one of the hardest government databases to manage. And why is that? Well, voter registration data, unlike many other government databases, you're not compelled under the law to update your data. So let's say you move and you take your dog with you. You have to update your license with your dog, that's required. If you move, you have to update your data with DMV. You have to update your data with the passport office. I mean, I could go on and on. You do not have to update anything with my office. Let's say you move out of California, as an example, and the house that you move, move out of stays vacant. So nobody's there to collect mail. You don't tell anybody that you've moved. You don't leave a message with the post office that you've moved, and this happens all the time. 
So we're still sending out mail to that office and it still shows us an active voter, a registered voter, because there's no intrastate system that connects voter registration databases from state to state to pick up data. There is a private consortium, it's called ERIC, that has done that in some states, but not in California. And so that's a challenge when you have people that move. Um, and there's a requirement under California law that we do essentially three things. We have to process what's called NCOA data. That's national change of address data. That's when you go to the post office and you fill out a form and you said, I've moved, if you do that, and then we pick up that data and make those changes. The second thing we have to do is look at death data. Uh, that's in-state data from the county health department, as well as from the, the state health department for deceased voters. And the third is that we have to look at felon data. Now, the law recently changed uh, in California based on a proposition that allows uh, felons that are on parole to vote. So that's changed a bit. Um, but those are basically kind of the three biggest concepts. Now, the problem with that is this. If that, let me use that example of someone moving out of California. We don't pick up any of that data through those processes that I just spoke about, how would we find them? Well, we've entered into partnerships with uh, Experian, and uh, we're actually now starting to work with TransUnion on some tests as well, to pick up third-party data. Because if you go to Arizona, let's say, and you fill out an application for a new house mortgage or an apartment, that's going to be picked up on the data we're looking at now. And now I can send a postcard to you in Arizona and say, did you move out of California? Can you confirm this so we can cancel you on the rolls? Uh, and that's worked really well. And I want to give you a quick anecdotal story. We had a gentleman that uh, called to my office very upset that we sent him a postcard in Austin, Texas. And he said that he was uh, attempting to hide from his ex-wife. And he had moved to Austin, Texas, and did not tell anybody about that move. But here we sent him a postcard saying, do you want your voter registration canceled? Because we picked up that data. So this is something that's working for us. In fact, in uh, 2020 alone, we were able to cancel 25,000 voters that we would not have picked up through any other source of data other than this third-party data that we're doing. Only county in California that's doing this. Despite that, voter list maintenance is like a flowing river. It is a river of data that changes minute by minute. And so to keep up with that and to keep those records 100% clean, it's impossible because of these issues of not needing to update your information when you move. I did wanna share a couple of quick stats with you. Um, this is just in, since November of 2020, after the election, we have canceled uh, 18,173 records due to deceased voters. We, before the law changed, had canceled 520 felons that were sent to state prison. And then we updated 56,000 records for those voters that moved either in county, out of county, or out of state. And that's been since November of 2020 and the data that we've been working on. Uh, again, it's, it's something that's ongoing process and, and changing minute by minute uh, and, and working on duplicate voters is another issue we could talk about um, that we've done here in the county before the recall election. Uh, but suffice it to say, it's an ongoing process. We're the only county in California uh, that prints our own ballots. Uh, we're the only county in, Cal in the United States other than Miami-Dade that prints our own ballots. This is unique uh, to Orange County. One of the reasons I wanted to bring that in house was that all the other counties are using vendors to print their ballots. I don't think that's a good thing from a chain of custody perspective. I think having the chain of custody internal to the county is very important. The other piece of this is that if vendors are making mistakes, the vendors are not taking the hits, it's the county taking the hits. We need to control this process and build a very uh, uh, tight quality control piece around this printing process. So we take raw paper stock from mills around the country. We turn it into printed ballots, into your ballot packets that we mail you. We do all of that in-house. None of that is outsourced to outside vendors. That's all done internally. We've been able to certify much quicker and to have efficiencies in our ballot scanning uh, and post-election process because of the things that we do in-house versus sending out house or sending out uh, sourced. And this has worked really well. A couple of uh, closing remarks related to what we do here internally for training and management. Um, I'm proud of our partnership that we've had with Southwest Airlines and the NTSB. We've developed a, a very um, 
robust program here, what's called true crew resource management or CRM. That's the same thing that pilots use in cockpits today. And it, it essentially encompasses three things. One is leadership, communication, and situational awareness. And why this is really important is elections are very fast moving. You, once you get into the election cycle itself, you have very tight deadlines. You can't deviate from those deadlines. And any mistake that you make in elections is amplified, as you know. Just read the news around from other states and, and the issues that have happened here in California as well. Uh, and so this CRM process keeps that management piece very tight. The byproduct of this is checklists. We have developed thousands of checklists for use here in the department for every piece of the, the process that we conduct. For instance, when it's time to tally the votes, we go through a series of checklists before we even start the process, just like you would landing an aircraft or taking off. Uh, and I'm proud to say the NTSB and the work they've done with us said we're the only election office they've ever heard from that wanted to learn more about CRM and to, to deploy that. And finally, we uh, hope to have uh, what's called ISO 9001 certification by the end of the year. We've been working on this now for a year. And uh, this is unique also to elections. This is a quality management certification from the ISO uh, standards organization. And we will be audited uh, starting in just a couple of weeks. And that will carry on throughout the end of the year from ISO auditors to make sure that we have quality control process in place that we've worked on over the last year. Uh, and, and they'll be doing that audit and then uh, hopefully awarding a certification will be the only election office in the country that has the certification. And I think the reason that's important is because we do all these internal pro uh, processes like printing our own ballots and our mailing and having that ISO 9001 process is really important or it's certification. I did want to cover one last thing. Uh, one of the questions that came in early on that I thought was really important to address and that is um, you know, some individuals have reported that they went to their vote center during the recall election and were told they had already cast a ballot. And uh, those are reports that we did get, small numbers. If you consider that 1.1 million ballots were cast and we had uh, just a couple of hundred that fit into that category, um, those, those are small numbers in that, in that, that comparing the, the total ballots cast. But here's something that I want to point out. You know, many times when we look into these and you get closer to the details, we found in many instances that the family members had sent in a ballot for another family member. And then when they were confronted because we had opened an investigation, they didn't want to tell on the other family member or, you know, vice versa. And so these are issues, real world issues that we deal with on a daily basis. There are some cases where we've referred them to the district attorney and they, they have open investigations on these um, where we don't have answers and we're looking for those answers. Um, I will tell you that out of all the in-person ballots cast, which were just shy of 200,000, we had 185 that had reported that uh, a ballot showed that they had already cast a ballot. We, we did find some voters who forgot that they cast a ballot 30 days before election day. So I would just take um, what you read and hear in perspective, because it's not always what you might hear um, where the outcome is, especially when we get down into the weeds and the details. So with that, again, I want to extend my thanks uh, to Supervisor Bartlett for hosting this and for allowing me the time to present to you and then looking forward to dialogue and I'll turn it back over to Dwayne. Okay, well, thank you very much, Neil. I appreciate your time, appreciate the presentation. It was packed with a lot of information. But now we're gonna see if we can maybe dig in a little bit deeper on some of the questions that we received. Uh, as you registered, we received well over a hundred questions uh, in advance for this. And so we're gonna go through a few and see what we can get through. Anyway, let's start off with one. With now we have vote by mail and due to COVID-19, we send out a proactively send out a, a ballot to every registered voter. So with that, how do we guarantee that the votes that we're receiving are from, from that, that registered voter? And how do we how do we know after this whether or not they've moved or not? What are we doing to secure that? Yeah, thanks, Dwayne. So uh, a couple of things related to mail balloting. Number one, um, every ballot that's issued and, and printed and generated and mailed is appended to a record for the voter. And that ballot resides with that voter record all the way through the process. And only one ballot can be issued to a single voter. Our system can't generate a second ballot unless the first one is voided. 
So if we, let's say a, a voter called in and said, hey, I never received my ballot, and we issue that second ballot, that first one's automatically voided and the second one's mailed. On the return side, that voter record information is checked for every single ballot by a human being as opposed to software. There's some counties that use software. I don't think that that's reliable. Um, and especially if you're having election observation and the transparency piece of that, if you run a million ballots through software and you say 40% of them have a signature match based on the software, well, you haven't been able to see that process. So we do it all by hand uh, here in the office. Uh, and, and what happens is, is when that ballot comes in, it's scanned through an automated system, all the data is captured, data on the voter, the signature itself, the handwriting on the ballot, on the envelope itself is captured. Before that ballot's ever opened, it goes through about a 36 hour process. That includes the signature review, the record check, making sure it's an active registered voter, and that you only have one ballot coming in from that voter at a single time. Uh, one of the things that we do and the checks and balances to your question is, let's say somebody took that mail ballot and they walked to a, a, a mailbox and dropped it in the mailbox and then walked across the street to a vote center to cast a ballot. Well, that ballot's still sitting in the mailbox. My office hasn't received it yet. So we're going to show an in-person vote that you still are eligible to cast a ballot. We're going to give you that ballot. That's going to count. And as soon as that mail ballot hits my office, it's voided and it's outsourced, outsorted. And then we open an investigation with the district attorney. So there's a, a series of steps that are put in place to ensure the integrity of not only that mail ballot, but the process of preventing somebody from casting multiple ballots. We also, and I'll, I'll leave, leave you with this, Dwayne, we have a series of processes put into the printing system itself. We have done uh, several pilot programs on ink that we can detect in certain ways. You can't photocopy ballots. There are things I can't talk to you about related to the barcode in the ballot itself that provide protections. And so there's a tremendous amount that's done to secure that mail ballot. Okay. Well, thank you for that, Neil. Another question that we, we received numerous questions is on voter ID. Why don't we require ID when someone comes in to vote? I'm smiling, Dwayne, because that's the number one question I get all the time. <laughs> it's a good question. Uh, you know, and over the years, I, I've thought a lot about this. And from an administrative standpoint, it would be very easy to administer. Um, you're, you're training people to check an ID against a record. That's pretty easy to do. And in fact, our system is set up here in Orange County now with our new system to be able to scan a driver's license when you would walk in and provide that, that ID. Unfortunately, in California, the legislature uh, has not seen fit to go down the path of a voter ID law. There have been many bills introduced that have died in committee. Um, I personally think that the optics of having ID law are not a bad thing, but that's above my pay grade, and that's something the legislature has to sort out. And I've said many times, the only way you're probably going to get an ID law in California is a voter-led initiative that would put that item on the ballot to require an ID during voting. And in fact, that just happened. The first, I've been talking about this for 15 years and someone has filed uh, with the attorney general a, uh, an initiative that you might see in circulation here shortly that would go to the ballot and ask that question of the voters. Very good, thank you. Another question we have is about the 2020 election, 2021 recall election and is there going to be an audit to ensure that there was no fraud? Do we do that in, in Orange County or is that being done throughout the state? So as I mentioned uh, during the presentation, we've done a series of audits. Um, a lot of folks think that once election day hits, you're done. Well, in California, you have 30 days to complete the process. And that includes those series of audits that we've conducted here in the county, not only the ones required under state and federal law, but the ones that are not. And I forward all that information and data on to the Secretary of State, uh, even if it's not required by law. And so all of the audits and the checks that we did on the recall election, including the work that Caltech is doing on the voter registration side, do not show anomalies or issues uh, with our system or uh, ballots being counted the way that voters intended them to be counted. That end-to-end -end piece that I'm talking about with that, hopefully that pilot program um, coming up in 22 would, I think, be the bookend to that. And the bookend is, okay, you're telling us all that, you're publishing this information, you're doing these audits, but how do I know as a voter? 
if I voted for you, Dwayne, on a contest, how do I know that my ballot was counted for your name? And this would give you that, uh, that assurance and that ability to check that. So uh, that would be the final piece. Very good. You know, you talked a little bit about people moving, dying, you know, taking, taking felons, certain felons off of the, the electric, the, the rolls. So you're working with third parties with Experian and others to make sure that we can verify our system. We're doing that. We're cleaning up our system here in Orange County. What about the rest of the state? What's happening there? What can we do to see that, 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 that the rolls are cleaned up throughout the whole state of California? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I you know, was, when I was president of our association, I was advocating as much as I could over that issue because we're only as good as our weakest link, right? We can do a, a better job here in Orange County, but there may be other counties that aren't doing the same work. And, and so when you're looking at a statewide election, what does that mean? I continue to advocate for that. I would, I would urge individuals to, um, to think about ways to, to advocate for that. I can't be a lobbyist. I'm not going to push that, but I will tell you this, that um, eventually what's going to have to happen is a change in the law and uh, to make that requirement up and down the state. Uh, and until that, it's, it's going to be troubling. The one thing that I'm happy to share just from a metrics perspective, because I'm a data hound, is that our undeliverable rate, and one of the ways that we check how are we doing compared to other counties is much lower. So for instance, when we mail out ballots, what are we seeing coming back? It's less than 2%. And you might say, well, I don't like that it's even, you know, 2%, but compare that to marketing mailings, for instance, and the average for a marketing mailing is a 10% return rate on undeliverable material. And so that's a metric that I'm always focused on and making sure that we're doing the best job we can. But again, it's got to be done statewide to make it truly effective. Very good. You know, transparency is extremely important when it comes to voting. So Tell us a little bit about observers that come into to Orange County to observe the voting process. How does that work and, and how's, that, how's that worked out in Orange County? Well, I'm, I'm happy to say we recently had a delegation from Georgia and Pennsylvania and Michigan come in to see how we were doing that because I think they're looking to replicate that for their elections coming up. Uh, what we did was is we developed a very robust uh, broadcast platform uh, that we enabled individuals during COVID to be able to view every single part of the post-election process, including signature review, which was unheard of. And so they would go through a, a login procedure, get an approval to be able to see the data, and then they could compare uh, the signature on screen, what we were doing, looking at the audits, et cetera. We continued that, Dwayne, post-COVID as well. So for the election that just passed, we continued that broadcast platform. And, and so we encourage, I do, have always encouraged observers to come in and, and view the process. It's open to the public, transparent 100% from the moment we start processing ballots until we're completed. And over the past election, uh, we saw about 20 to 25 observers come through uh, in person, more online. But when you compare that to the November 2020 election, at one point, my office had 250 people in here. Uh, and so there's interest in observing the process, but we saw a big reduction for the recall. Very good. You know, people are allowed to register the same day to vote. How do you verify their information is legitimate and that they aren't registered in multiple places and multiple times? How do we know that that, that vote is correct? So on same day registration, when they show up in person, they fill out a registration form is essentially what they're doing. And then they're given a ballot, they cast that ballot, and that ballot is put into a holding pattern. Once that comes back to my office, that registration data, then our team keys that in like a normal voter registration. It's checked against the statewide system to make sure they're not registered in another county. Uh, and, and that's connected throughout all 58 counties. Once we go through that checking process, just like you would on a regular registration, then that ballot is activated and allowed to be put into the count. So it's never even tallied until you go through that checking process to make sure that those, those individuals are not registered in other counties. Very good. Well, Neil, we're, we're running out of time at this point. So, so right now I'd like to see if you have any closing statements that you'd like to make to our audience. Well, thank you again for the opportunity to, to present to you today. I, I want to encourage individuals, if you have further questions, feel free to reach out to me directly. I'm happy to answer them. 
Um, I know Vicki and Dwayne, you have my email and I'm, I'm happy to, to deal with those individually. But more importantly too, on our website, in our, what we call our election library, we have published about 75 reports and data from third parties, as well as my office on the work we're doing on election security. Um, we published an election security playbook um, that is the one, the piece that we can show publicly is published. And then we also have the private version that we work with Homeland Security on. And so I just want voters to know I'm a voter too. And I want my vote to be counted and I want my ballot to be protected. And so the work that we're doing here is focused 100% on election security and ensuring that we can maintain an, a, a fully uh, system with full integrity uh, during every single election. That's very important to me. I don't want to sign my name on a certification until that process is done. We'll continue to expand audits. We'll continue to look at ways to improve the process. And I just want to assure, uh, assure voters that um, we're not going to stop. We're not going to rest. We're going to keep going. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Neil. It's, it's a privilege to have you here with us today. Appreciate your time. Thank I also you. want to say thank you very much to Supervisor Lisa Bartlett, who put this together. And most importantly, I want to thank you, those, those that, that tuned in and, and were part of this. Special thank to our, thanks to our Chambers of Commerce for, for noticing this webinar and especially to Vicki McMurchie with the Dana Point Chamber of Commerce for facilitating. So thank you very much for joining us today. If you have any additional questions, please reach out to your Chamber of Commerce. We'll funnel those in and, and get the uh, questions to Neil. So thank you very much for joining us today. Have a great day.